Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. This is National Park Week, so if you haven't figured out where to go just yet, head over to nationalparkstraveler.org, where we take a look at some possibly overlooked destinations that might interest you. This past week, we also had stories about parks with incredible sand dunes, Kobuk Valley in Alaska, Great Sand Dunes in Colorado, and White Sands National Monument in New Mexico. And we also had a story about efforts to stop the expansion of a coal mine near Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. For those and other stories, visit nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, I talk with Andrew Harrington, a search and rescue expert at Great Smoky Mountains National Park, about how to stay safe in the parks. I also visit with artist Molly Hashimoto about her latest book on sketching birds you see in national parks. And we conclude with a hike into the Peaked Hill Bars Historic District at Cape Cod National Seashore. Sadly, every year in the national park system, people go missing. Just this past winter, three men vanished somewhere in the backcountry of Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. Last fall, an Ohio woman got separated from her daughter near Klingman's Dome in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Her body was found off trail a week later, just about two miles from the parking area at Klingman's Dome. Currently, there are about 60 unresolved missing persons cases in the National Park System, according to the National Park Service. The exact number is not publicly available, but it could be hundreds or more. Most search and rescue missions end quickly with the subject or subjects found, but others remain frustratingly unresolved. With landscapes ranging from above timberline alpine settings and dense forests cut by canyons to desertscapes and oceans, the national park system can be a surprisingly easy place to go and stay missing. More than a few visitors to our national parks venture down a trail not properly prepared. To help you develop a checklist to stay safe when you go for a hike, we've turned today to Andrew Harrington, a ranger at Great Smoky Mountains National Park and the force behind Big Pig Outdoors, which he describes as a Smoky Mountain bushcraft and survival school. Welcome, Andrew. Hey, thank you. Let's start with a a pretty simple question, um, though it might not have a simple answer, and that is, why do so many people get lost in the national park system? Well, uh, number one is uh, statistically just the numbers. You know, millions of visitors head off to the woods every year in our parks. And then the other part is, you know, the old Boy Scout motto is be prepared, and not, not too many people kind of follow that nowadays. You know, I've also been told that um, a lot of people, they, they go to the national parks for a vacation to get away from their, their job and the, the hecticness of the, the, the world out there. And somebody actually put it that sometimes they, they put their brain on vacation, too, and they, they forget to realize that um, while they are in a beautiful location, it's not exactly a tame location. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, you know, if you, if you think about how most people are uh, living their lives today, they're pretty cut off from the natural world, you know, as far as navigation skills, you know, most of us rely on, you know, our, our GPS apps on our phone or, or in the car. And, you know, not too many people have to uh, think about, hey, if I get caught out tonight, um, you know, what am I going to have to keep me warm? You know, all the modern day conveniences kind of kind of make us soft in that regards where we, we don't have those uh, those everyday threats in natural or in our, in our society compared to the natural world. Right. And I, and I guess uh, not everybody's in, in peak physical condition to, to go on a, a, a seven to 10 mile hike or to rappel down a cliff or to uh, paddle across a lake. Yeah, that, that's definitely part of it. We get a lot of uh, visitors that uh, either A, you know, just lack of mobility, fall and twist their ankle because they're not used to walking on uneven surfaces or just get exhausted and have to get, uh, get litter teamed out. So. Now, across the park system, I know they, they keep statistics every year of uh, search and rescue missions out there. Is there any one particular activity that seems to get people in trouble? Well, hiking statistically, um, you know, and then some of the big leaders out west, like Lake, uh, Lake Mead, you know, definitely there's a lot of drownings out there as well. Any type of water, you have a lot of fatalities when water is involved. Is, is there one park that seems to be responsible for, for more SARS than any other park? Yeah, Lake Mead is number one. Really? Yeah, and then followed by Grand Canyon, Yosemite. Our park, the Smokies, is uh, number six. Even though we're first in visitation, we're number six in search rate. And and what are most of the um, the, the missions at uh, Great Smokies involving? 
Uh, pretty much down the middle, we have on average about 100 instances per year, and about 50% of those are injuries, and about 50% of them are overdue hikers, whether they got lost or it got dark on them. They didn't have a flashlight. Now, now that brings us to the next question, and which is, uh, you know, how should people prepare themselves for for going out into a national park, whether it's for a, a short day hike or a, a multi day backpack trip? You know, the, the preparation I always say it all, always starts at home. You know, I mean, we tend to focus on gear so much, but you know, I, the way I teach is I, I talk about kind of like mindset first. You know, so understand that you know it's your responsibility when you go to the woods as far as, as, uh, your safety and, and, and rescue in that regard. A lot of people make the assumption that if they can get out on nine one one and and call the call dispatch or the emergency call center, that helicopters are going to show up and Rangers are going to drop out of the sky and save them. But it doesn't always work that way. You know, we have to consider what type of weather there is, you know, where the person's missing, you know, as far as sending our resources off trail, are we exposing them to injury? And so one of the first things, uh, well, first parts of a search and rescue is an investigation phase. And there's a document called a search urgency form. And basically it's a way of assigning a number to you. It determines, Hey, is this an immediate emergency where we need to send our resources off trail, uh, looking for this person? Can we evaluate, you know, if it's, uh, the person has it, as the type of gear and training necessary for the environment. And so one of the things I do in my classes is, is I have everybody do a search urgency form and pretty much 99% of the people that are in some of my classes then realize, Hey, if I'm off trail, I'm probably going to be spending the night out. Now we'll put people on trail at night looking for you, but it'll probably be just on trail on a hasty search. But as far as if you're off trail and lost, there's a pretty good chance if you're, if you're not young, um, or not very old and not injured uh, that that you maybe spend the night out. So th- the first thing to do is wrap your head around the the responsibility on yourself to be prepared. You know, we hear a lot um, when when press releases go out about a, a search and rescue mission about a hasty search. What exactly is a hasty search? So a hasty search is one of the first the, one of the first things you do is determine a, a point last seen or last known point, right? So if you went missing. During that investigation phase, we'd try to figure out well, where was Kurt last seen or where's Kurt's vehicle. At that point, that's where we start planning. It's called the initial planning point. There is a lost person behavior is statistics, you know, which can show us like, hey, how far would he typically hike in this amount of time? Uh, but generally, most people, if they're on a trail, they're going to stay on a trail. Hopefully, they'll sit down on the side of the trail. So the first, one of the first things we do is we actually put uh, two or three people out on a trail and just start hiking that trail. And, um, you know, we kind of, the, in the kind of the containment theory, we'll, we'll kind of box you in on trails. So if your vehicle is at a certain trailhead, we'd put people on that trailhead looking for you. If that trail came out somewhere else, we would also launch a, a team in from that other side to see if you popped out of that other now you're talking about being prepared out there, and the uh, in many cases the technology um, can outpace an individual's ability and, and get folks in trouble. I know I've seen that with uh, uh, backcountry skiing, for instance. The the ski gear that they're making is so incredible that it's it's easier than it used to be, and and people discover that gosh, we've gone farther than we should have, and, and we find ourselves in trouble. Um, and then certainly with the advent of cell phones, people figures if they they got a cell phone, they're safe because they can call people, but there's not always going to be a, a cell signal out there in the backcountry. Do, do you find that is the case sometimes? Both the um, technology uh, gives people a, a false sense of security and then, you know, the reliance on the cell phone where they don't have a signal? Yeah. I mean, once again, we're kind of spoiled, right? You know, we can call a cell phone and get 911 and have someone show up pretty quickly when we're in town. But, you know, where, where, I, where I live right now, where I'm talking to you from right now, we don't have cell signal. I live right next to the park. So the district I work in, the Smokies, there's very little cell service. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, one thing with that, is even if your phone says that, you know, a little tip on that, even if your phone says it doesn't have cell service, still try and call 911, you know, because by law, the any carrier that can pick up your call will transmit that call. Really? That, that's good to know. 
We've been talking with Andrew Harrington. He's the founder and team leader of BUSAR, uh, Backcountry Unit Search and Rescue around the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. He's also the force behind Big Pig Outdoors, a Smoky Mountain bushcraft and survival school. And uh, he also works uh, seasonally for the National Park Service as a wildlife technician, chasing down wild pigs in the park and working with bears there. We'll be right back in a minute. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles from Key West, just very well might be the most remote national park in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing on pristine beaches. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. Okay, we're back now with Andrew Harrington, a search and rescue expert uh, based uh, at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Andrew, last fall there was a situation where a, a woman from Ohio got lost in the park, and she had been hiking with her daughter near... Um, Klingman's Dome, I believe. And um, they got separated and it took about a week to find her. And somehow she had wandered off the Appalachian Trail and died just a couple miles from the parking area there at Klingman's Dome. Was it ever determined exactly how she she got lost and and off trail? You know, we'll we'll never know exactly what happened, of course. But, you know, in in any search, you know, not specifically Sue's, um, this happens just to a lot of people. We have something called a decision point. And so a decision point is as you're walking down a trail, there may be split in the trail. There may be a animal trail that intersects it or just even a water bar. And those little decision points, as you come up to it, whether you're recognizing them or not, that's where typically people make mistakes, right? And so if you're headed down a trail and maybe you haven't been paying attention and you don't recognize that the trail off to your right heads back to the parking lot and you just keep headed down the trail straight, then that would be a situation where you missed a decision point. But that happens, not only did it happen to Sue, it happens very, very frequently. And I guess people um, overlook the fact of, of what a wild place the Smokies are. I mean, it, it can't be overstated that uh, off trail, you've got the, the tangle of vegetation and, and rocks and, uh, of course, the wild animals, whether it's a wild boar or a, a black bear. Yeah, I mean, it's a big country out here. Once you get off the trail system, it's, uh, you know, you have to know what you're doing off trail for sure. And of course, then there's hypothermia, which can um, set in a little bit quicker than people might assume. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, a lot of people think hypothermia is specifically for cold weather, but, you know, I believe Texas is one of the leading states in hypothermia, you know, and so, you know, it can be in the 60s or 50s. And if you get wet and you don't have the right clothing, if you're wearing cotton clothing, then it can be bad news, especially if you're spending the night out. What what keys should people um, keep in mind if they find themselves lost? You know, uh, once again, going back to the kind of three principles that I, I really harp on is mindset, skills, and gear. And so when we start talking about skills, you know, we need to talk about the navigation as far as the, the off trail even if it's not off trail, you know, just, just general navigation. A lot of people will come up to me in the park and say, Hey, I'm not sure where I am. And they're holding their maps upside down. You know, they don't even have their map on top of the map facing North. So yeah, every, of course, everything they're looking at looks upside down. Just not, it's not relating in their head. 
you know, but I, I push everyone that come through my, my programs to take a good, you know, uh, wilderness survival course, a good land navigation course, and a good wilderness first aid class. And if you do all three of those, you're pretty much ready for 99% of wilderness emergency with the most prevalent statistically being an injury. So that's why I think a good two-day wilderness first aid class is the first place to start. What do you think about these um, cell phone apps that uh, you don't need cell service to be able to, you know, have GPS tracking your uh, your movement? Yeah, they're great. I run a, a Venza on mine, uh, A-V-E-N-Z-A, and I've got all 26 maps of the, the park downloaded on my phone. So they're, they're a great tool. Another great tool is uh, CalTopo, C-A-L-T-O-P-O. You can get online and you can download free uh, 1 in 24 maps of the area you're hiking. Yeah, I use Gaia myself. I find it's pretty good. Yeah, so that's that's good. You know, you always want to have a paper map with you, and then you can have your electronic backups as well. And, of course, you want to know how to read the paper map and uh, some rudimentary compass skills. Oh, yeah. You know, I went through the Boy Scouts when I was younger some decades ago, and uh, they always talk, talk to you about being prepared and whatnot. What are some of the essentials um, people should be taking, whether they're going on just a, what they think might be a, a couple-hour hike or a, a couple-day backcountry adventure? A lot of people push the 10 essentials, you know, the you know map, compass, you know, sunglasses, extra clothing. I'm reading this off a list, by the way. Headlamp, mm. first aid supplies, fire star matches, knife, extra food. You know, that's the traditional 10 essentials. You know, what I tell people is make sure that you can treat a uh, major injury, you know, trauma, you know, that's trauma typically happens from a fall or something falling on you or some type of vehicle accident, whether it's a mountain bike or, you know, a, a vehicle, car or something like that. And then make sure you can, you have the ability to spend the night out, right? So spend the night out means your clothing system's either warm enough or you're carrying, you know, a, a quilt or um, some type of sleeping bag system. Or, you know, just even just a garbage bag, a large contracted garbage bag can make a big difference, you know, Um, and it doesn't, you know, weighs an ounce and a half. So anything else? Oh, yeah. I mean, headlamp, you know, the, you know, fire starting gear, you know, those are the big things. You know, if you can stay warm, you can stay hydrated. That's that's pretty much the name of the game. You know, food's so way down on the list that I didn't even register. Most of us have enough body fat on us to last a month. So. Wow. No. And of course, um, stay in place. Yeah. You know, that's, that's one of those big debates. You know, there are people that are alive today because they stayed put and there are people that are dead today because they stayed put. You know, there's a lady that uh, died on the Appalachian trail uh, a couple of years back, she set off trail for, you know, 20 something days. Um, but if she had just picked a, a, you know, a bailout direction and stuck with it, she would have been, you know, she would have made it out to a, a trail. You know, so basically the, the advice I give is we're all, all have the ability to critically think. So if you've told someone where you're going and you have a reasonable expectation that someone may be looking for you, then you absolutely stay put. Or if you're on a linear feature, such as a trail or on a creek, stay put. You know, those linear features are, are commonly where people are found. So this is one of the first places we look. If, you know, you didn't tell anyone and you have no expectation anyone's going to look for you and you think you can make it to a linear feature, then, you know, that's going to be your decision. But it, it's it's very hard to say, always do this, always do that, because every situation is different. You know, you may be able to climb the top of a ridge and get a cell phone signal call out. So we've seen that happen as well. And I've heard that if you follow a, a stream downhill, um, you'll, you'll eventually come to a road crossing. Um, is, that, is that accurate or is that old wives' tale? Yeah. So, you know, they used to teach that, you know, that was, that was a long time ago. They said, Hey, follow Creek downhill, you know, and then along came hug a tree program. And this, this is my analysis of the stuff. Along came hug a tree program, which taught people to kind of stay put. And then nowadays you have these uh, reality TV survival shows that the host is like, I've got three days to get out of here. You know, they're doing all types of stupid stuff running around the woods. And, and I think that's causing more problems than good. So definitely staying put is your best option. You know, especially if you are on a trail, if if you can just sit down on the side of the trail, more than likely we're going to find you on that hasty search. If uh, if you are, you know, the one thing about like here in the Smokies, falling a creek downhill, usually it means you're going to end up in a roto thicket, thicket of rhododendron, and you're going to wish you hadn't done it. But it can be very, very thick and very, very challenging. Now, over on this side of the park where I work, you know, falling that creek downhill is just going to end up where you're down the lake bank. You know, and if it's winter time. You know, and you're back in some cove, there's very little chances that someone's going to find you back there. So 
once again, you know, it, it all comes down to preparation. You know, the, you know, to talk about the survival shows, you know, real survival is about making good decisions and mitigating risk, you know? So if, if someone really wanted to make a survival show, it would show someone studying maps, you know, taking classes, you know, going down and getting the right gear, you know, leaving a trip plan before they went out. And then, you know, maybe if they get hurt, they treat their injury, they pull out a satellite messenger or PLB out of their backpack. They hit the button and wait for the rescue team. But, you know, it's completely boring. Nobody's going to watch that on TV. (laughs) Sad but true. Sad but true. We've been talking today with Andrew Harrington, the founder and team leader of BUSAR, a backcountry unit search and rescue program out of uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. He's also the force behind Big Pig Outdoors, which he describes as Smoky Mountain Bushcraft and Survival School. You can find it on the web at bigpigoutdoors.com. Andrew, we appreciate your advice today and uh, hope it's a safe season this summer in the park. Thank you. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. Just about everywhere you go in the national park system, except underwater, of course, there are feathered creatures, birds of all sizes and colors, birds that soar high overhead, those that find cover on the ground, and those that thrill us with their songs. About a year ago, we received a review copy of Colors of the West, an artist's guide to nature's palette. Illustrated and written by Molly Hashimoto, this wonderful book that draws on national park settings is both guidebook and artistic instruction and inspiration. Miss Hashimoto's latest book, Birds of the West, An Artist's Guide, is due out in May. Also compiled from her visits to national parks, this can be viewed as a sequel to Colors of the West and another installment in teaching the rest of us how we can be better artists. Thanks so much for joining us today, Molly. Thank you for inviting me. Now, in in reading through this book and and some of the introductory materials, you really had a, a fairly early introduction to the national parks with your family's travels on vacation. Yes, uh, yes, we did. Um, went to Great Smokies when I was probably 10 years old and uh, made a lasting impression on me. I would still remember the black bear that came walking through our tent. That must have been thrilling. Uh, very thrilling. I do remember spending the rest of that night in the car. <laughs> <laughs> now, did that get you started going down the road of, of art or um, did that come later in life? Well, About that time, I started doing drawings, kind of like cartoons of my family and our pets. So that is what prompted my future journey in art. Now, you've really uh, are more than just an artist. I mean, in looking through both of these books, I mean, it's not just a book of illustrations, but it's part art history, part technique, even part bird behavior. Is that just something you picked up through your your artistic endeavors out in nature, or did you um, go to school for some of those uh, additional aspects? You know, when I was in college, I was an English major. So writing, reading, research. That's something that I did a lot of training in. Art was always my passion, my hobby. So that I developed pretty much on my own, although I did take a lot of classes. But the reading and research just goes along for me with doing the art, because if I see something really beautiful or interesting, fascinating, 
it's not enough just to see it, take pictures of it, draw it. I really want to do research on it and it enriches my experience. Um, you know, it builds my memories just to know more about what I'm working on. And does some of that um, understanding of bird behavior influence uh, some of your illustrations? Does it, does it help contribute to making them stronger? Oh, yeah, definitely. Because in some of them you'll see in the book, I really like to include a feeling for the habitat or a feeling for the gesture of a particular bird. You know, some birds are really perky. Some birds are not. And so the poses that they strike, that's important to know. Now, obviously, birds are all around us. I mean, as I was doing the dishes this morning, I was looking out my backyard and we've got some bird feeders and the goldfinches and the juncos were around. What influenced your your particular focus on national park settings for a lot of your artwork? Well, that has been where our family takes vacations for decades. And When you go to those places, you just see a lot more birds. I'd say aside from your own backyard and wetlands, like say if you're lucky enough to have wetlands in your city, which we are in Seattle, beyond that, the national parks are where so many species are to be found. And it's partly because they have so much habitat that's been undisturbed. Now, uh, I noticed in reading, um, on one aspect, you're, you're a plein air artist, but on the other hand, trying to capture a bird in a plein air setting is is a little more difficult than, say, a mountain range. You are so right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, birds can fly away. And so I would say sketching from life can be pretty difficult. You can look at your feeders and your bird baths and probably get some good, good poses there. Um, waterfowl are great because usually they travel in at least pairs, sometimes flocks. And so if one of them moves away, another one's probably going to strike up that same pose very shortly after. But the page in the book, the pages in the book on drawing from life, I went to the Seattle Aquarium where they have a wonderful exhibit of shorebirds. And those birds are confined and they can't fly away. And I had real good success there. Um, Zoos are also places where if you want to draw from life, they're generally some really good exhibits yeah yeah is there a particular um favorite medium you have to work with or a a favorite medium that provides the best depictions of birds well that's a good question and i do answer it in the book i'm very curious about exploring many different media and i also feel that no one media can medium can capture what is really unique about any given species and Sometimes I'll use different media for the same species. If I take a picture or see something that's really remarkable, I'm not done with it after I do, say, a drawing or watercolor. I often want to try it as a relief print or an etching. So um, I don't I don't settle on one medium ever. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, and so when, when you head out to, say, uh, a national park setting, um, a sketch pad and camera is pretty much your basic uh, tools that, on that first trip? That's right, definitely. And I take a lot of photos. And when I come back home, I often use my photos. Sometimes I'll find the perfect photo, but very rarely. So then I'll synthesize from several different photos. I'll, I'll uh, research online. Sometimes there's a good pose online, uh, generally uh, field guides are also really helpful. So yeah, I use a lot of resources and I do feel that working at home once you've returned from a trip, it's really a wonderful way to keep the trip alive in your mind. And, you know, I've gone on trips where I've worked on things for months afterwards and it's, it really enriches the experience. Yeah. Do you head out with a particular species in mind that you want to try and uh, capture, so to speak? Um, Well, when I've been to Yellowstone, I like going up to Specimen Ridge because there's a lot of wildlife up there. And I've seen some great birds up there, you know, just on the side. We were looking for grizzlies and uh, bighorn sheep. Um, What else? There's just a lot of wildlife on Specimen Ridge, but at the same time, I ended up seeing mountain bluebirds, 
always birds of prey up there. Mm-hmm. So they just kind of go along with all the rest of the wildlife. The birds do. Right, right. And does does any one particular park stand above the others for your work? Well, because I live in Seattle, um, there are two parks that I visit quite regularly. One is Mount Rainier National Park. I've seen some wonderful uh, birds there and wildlife. Because I've been so many times, it's it's just part of my life. I've been going there for decades. And then the North Cascades National Park, I teach for the North Cascades Institute. So I've been there, I think this will be my 14th or 15th year teaching for them. And because I've spent so much time there, I've seen an awful lot of birds there. Really exciting things like loons, which, you know, we don't have a whole lot of in Washington. We're not quite far enough north. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been to Glacier Bay National Park? No, I have not. Boy, my wife and I had the, the privilege, I would say, to, to visit there some some years ago, and we, we took the cruise up the bay, and I have never seen more bird species in one place in my life. Um, it was just a, a, a true potpourri of birds out there. Now, you know, you'd mentioned uh, you teach at North Cascades Institute. Do you have uh, particular workshops there or in Yellowstone this year that people might uh, look forward to and sign up for if it's not too late? Yeah, um, I will be at the North Cascades Institute. They have an environmental learning center, beautiful facility, and I'll be there in October. It's a great time to be there because colors are changing and we often try to get up to Washington Pass where Liberty Bell Mountain is bedecked with amazing larches that turn golden. It's one of those things you really have to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll be there in October. And Yellowstone, I probably won't be there until 2021, but I'm hoping to get back there to teach too. Yeah, that should be a lot of fun. We've been talking today with Molly Hashimoto, the artist behind Birds of the West, an artist guide that is coming out in May. You can usually find it in your uh, local bookstore or uh, anywhere online. Molly, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Kurt. The Grant Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at www.gtnpf.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It is an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. The Yosemite Conservancy inspires people to support projects and programs that preserve Yosemite National Park and enrich the visitor experience. The Conservancy funds transformative work throughout the park. The grant's donors support help protect diverse wildlife and plant species and restore the precious habitats they depend on. Grants also support improvements to miles of trails to ensure visitors can safely access Yosemite's wonders. Visit yosemiteconservancy.org to find more inspiration. Remnants of the past, of poets and artists who sought the stark inspiration offered by isolating, windswept dunes on the outer beaches of Cape Cod, stand weathered gray today. Some appear wobbly and are almost hidden by their embracing dunes, while others stand atop the hills of sand with sweeping views out into the Atlantic. This is a side of Cape Cod National Seashore without bike trails or greasy fried seafood stands, without an easily accessible beach for spending the day at. The pile of shoes and sandals at the trailhead sends a clear signal. This hike is best done barefoot. Your calves will let you know later that you've explored the Peak Hill Bar's historic district for walking up and down dunes of sand is a chore in which every step slides and stretches your calf muscles. 
As you weave your way through the dunes, the shacks that come into view leave you wondering who in their right mind would haul planks of wood and furnishings out to this remote area to set up a hermit-like existence. The 19 shacks that are sheltered within the historic district date to the early and mid-1900s, though the practice of living in the dunes dates to the late 1800s, when similar shacks were built to house men, and sometimes their families, who toiled for the U.S. life-saving service. The service was a successor to the Massachusetts Humane Society that was organized in 1785. That society provided a rescue service for foundering ships and erected small huts along the Massachusetts coastline to provide shelter for passengers and crew who managed to reach shore. The life-saving service in 1878 was formally created by Congress. Stations popped up along the U.S. coast. Eventually, there were outposts on the Great Lakes, along the Gulf Coast, and along the Pacific Coast. By the time the U.S. Life Saving Service gave way to the U.S. Coast Guard in 1915, there were 279 stations in operation, and more than 177,000 lives had been saved. In 2012, the Peak Hill Bars area was added to the National Register of Historic Places. The qualifying merits of the 1950-acre area included the Dune Shack architecture, associations with art and literature, the life of poet Harry Kemp, potential archaeological resources, and the complex strands of maritime history, recreation, and the efforts of longtime dune shack dwellers who lovingly crafted homes amidst the shifting sands of the backshore of Truro and Provincetown. According to Wikipedia, Harry Kemp was also known as the Poet of the Dunes. Kemp lived on and off in a shack in the dunes of Provincetown, Cape Cod, for a period of about 40 years, and he died there in 1960. A 1934 Kemp poem titled The Last Return was written for the Coast Guard men who steadfastly worked to save the lives of those shipwrecked on Cape Cod's coast. Playwright Eugene O'Neill took up summer residence in the original Peak Hill Bar's life-saving station, which was built in 1872, after it was closed in 1918. Today, 18 of the 19 shacks are owned by the National Park Service, which lets nonprofit groups utilize some of them. In applying for listing on the National Register of Historic Places, the Park Service turned to a local historian to document the significance of the collection of shacks. Longtime dune dweller and historian Josephine Del Dio captured the philosophical approach to the traditions of the district as embodied in the physical shacks themselves. The dune shacks, she wrote, are, metamorphically speaking, almost an archaeological resource, having been structures used at various periods for varying purposes. The several buildings of the Coast Guard stations at Peaked Hill, a boathouse, a halfway house to poets' abodes, painter studios, naturalist lookout, a home of essential spiritual retreat and rejuvenation for persons from every walk of life. These small, nameless abodes, by their very simplicity serving to teach and retain for our society the first lesson of nature, the law of survival for all creatures of the earth. Hundreds, perhaps thousands, have sought inspiration here and many more will come to worship in these shelters of the human spirit. Some of the remaining shacks have intriguing histories, according to the National Park Service. For instance, there's one that features aluminum foil sheets placed on the bedroom wall for use in reflecting lamplight. Another shack was built in 1976 atop the original shack that dated to 1942. It features mural paintings on the interior walls. Yet another shack was built in 1931 and is actually winterized and features a sitting chair on the roof ridge. As we roamed the dune fields, we passed through patches of vegetation and were surprised when shacks popped up, both on top of dunes and at the bottom in hollows. Scrub pine, wild cherry, and beech plum grow here, as does bayberry, beech grass, scrub oak, cotton grass, and salt spray rose. Roaming through this area of the National Seashore can take you back, if you're imaginative, the days before Route 6 was built down the Cape in 1926 and greatly increased the human pressure on the landscape. For much of our hike, we were alone with the breezes, the birds, and the waving vegetation. Trails you follow are those pounded into sand by millions of visitors down through the decades or just last week. But you can venture off in just about any direction you want. Just be careful around the vegetation. A visit to Peaked Hill Bars can take an hour or all day, depending on your mood and what you've come in search of. Is it inspiration, a walk along the beach, a window into the past? That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. This is Kurt Repencheck for National Parks Traveler. See you in the parks.
The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park Audio Series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.